Okay, hello to everybody. Um, I'm very, very glad to open today's uh, lectures by the new honorary doctors of Estonian Academy of Arts. And it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Raihan Martin, who is a professor of architecture at Columbia Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, where he directs the Templeroyd Boyle Center for the study of American architecture. Raymond Martin is a member of Columbia's Institute for Comparative Literature and Society, as well as the Committee uh, on Global Thought. He has graduate diploma from the Architecture Association, and in 1999, Martin received uh, his PhD <coughs> from the Princeton University School of Architecture. For over decade, Martin was a partner in the firm of Martin Buxy Architects, and in 2000, he co-founded Grey Room, which is an influential journal of architecture, arts, media, and politics, which he co-edited until 2013. He has published widely on the history and theory of modern and contemporary architecture. He's uh, the author of Organizational Complex Architecture, Media and Corporate Space, published in 2003, MIT Press, and Utopia Coast Architecture and Postmodernism uh, in 2010, as well as the co-author with uh, Ganabari Paxi on Multinational City, Architectural Internaries, in 2007. In 2012, Martin co-created with uh, Barry Bergsdahl foreclosed rehousing the American Dream at the Museum of Modern Arts in New York, for which they also co-edited the exhibition catalog. His work centers on histories of space, power, and the aesthetic imagination, particularly as mediated by technical infrastructures. Related areas of research include architecture and epistemology, globalization and cities, and media history. Currently, Martin is working on two books, a history of the 19th century, American University as a media complex, and study of the contemporary city at the intersection of aesthetic and politics. So please join me welcoming Professor Reinhold Martin. Thank you so much. Uh, and, you know, I, uh, I, I want to, first of all, thank you so much for, for coming and, and for having me here. Um, and I really want to begin on a, on a personal note by, by thanking Mark Kalm and all of his colleagues, all of you, uh, here at the Estonian Academy of Arts for this unexpected honor uh, of an unearned doctorate, uh, which I'm not sure that I deserve. Uh, I will do what I can today to maybe convince you that, I don't know. <laughs> we'll talk about what a doctorate is at least. Um, but simply uh, and sincerely, Aita. I also begin uh, with, with some regret, uh, because unfortunately those fragments of the quite sim singular Estonian language uh, that I learned as a child uh, from my father and my grandmother have long disappeared from memory. Still, to the Esti Kunsti Academia, uh, on turning 105, Baluana <laughs> Sunipai. Something I used to hear when I was a kid, uh, now and then also. So, a, a centenary plus five, very good, happy to. Um, and, and actually, this is, the, this is really what I wanted to talk with you about, about this sort of century that we uh, have at least partly experienced together and, and that preceded us. Uh, in thinking about what to discuss with you today, I decided to reflect upon a long-standing theme in my own work, um, one that I expect to develop further in the near future. That theme is the interplay of order and disorder. So, order, in the sense that I intend it, uh, makes the world knowable and governable through the suppression, management, uh, or containment of disorder, 
which includes entropy or decay as well as well as willful disruption. So you know this is a kind of thing that in a in the design arts uh, we we deal with all the time, and I likewise do so um, as an historian. And and I'm gonna I'm also kind of I, I wanted to say uh, I had the privilege and honor of of speaking uh, at the uh, the European Architecture History Network's uh, conference. Uh, here in Tallinn uh, last year, hosted by again Andres and and, our, um, and all of his colleagues, and uh, and we spoke about the work of historians there. And and today, uh, I thought I would try to, in some sense, demonstrate uh, some of the things that that we were talking about uh, there uh, as a sort of follow up a little bit um, uh, to uh, to think about what we do as historians and particularly uh, of the design arts. So, and one of the things we do is think about order. So architecture as a medium of order will be my guide, uh, but not through the usual formal uh, spatial or functional analysis. Um, rather, the order with which I'll mainly be concerned is topological. That is, a question of insides and outsides, and the lines between them. On this, uh, as I said, my talk is retrospective since this occasion has caused me um, to look back for consistencies amid the jumble of two decades of writing on the history of architecture and other things, um, from which I've selected just a few related examples. You can think of this then as a historical report that begins uh, on the other side of, of the, on the American side uh, uh, of the Cold War and when works its way to our shared present. In the background will be some, some more general reflections on the political economy of design uh, as a will to order, uh, operating at the intersection of architecture, knowledge, and society. So, let's begin with knowledge. Uh, since we are, after all, in an institution of learning, of which there are many different types, and I have to say congratulations again on your wonderful new building. The last time I was here, it was just about getting finished, and it's a, a real uh, privilege to be able to speak in such a beautiful room. The institution in which I teach uh, and work, Columbia University in the city of New York, uh, is typical of the, of the research universities that grew out of the residential colleges um, during the late 19th century in the United States. This, this model, this general model of the research university, uh, which combines teaching with scholarship or advanced research, derives in significant measure from German precedent, uh, exemplified by the reorganization uh, of the University of Berlin in 1810. But not accidentally, we're speaking today uh, in an academy of arts. My own field, the history and theory of modern architecture, uh, centers much of its discourse on the output of any number of such academies, from the Parisian École des Beaux-Arts, uh, to the German Bauhaus, you know, sort of familiar stuff, right? The Es die Kunstakademie uh, belongs to this um, other tradition, the tradition of the art academy. Uh, founded, as I understand it, and 105 years ago, as a school of industrial arts in 1914, four years prior to the Bauhaus, that is, so you guys are kind of the more Bauhaus than the Bauhaus. Um, and, and going under various names since then, the EKA fits comfortably, I think, into the tradition of the modern art academy, um, <clears throat> with courses spanning from the fine arts to the applied arts, including architecture. Today, these curricula appear, uh, at least to me, quite clearly to reflect the organization of the EKA's faculties, as I understand it. Um, there's a faculty of architecture, a faculty of design, and a faculty of fine arts. But there's also another faculty, an institute, in fact, of art and visual culture. And although my own sense of these faculties is incomplete, and you can correct me on any, of, any errors I may make, um, <clears throat> the, um, I do know that, that the EKA's Institute of Art and Visual Culture includes a number of distinguished art historians. This is notable since there were no art historians teaching at the Bauhaus. So this is interestingly different. Nor, for that matter, have there been very many professional art historians teaching at art academies in Europe uh, or in the United States since then. This, of course, has been changing, but nonetheless, as a general pattern, uh, it's, it's different. The historians tend to be in the universities. 
Another striking characteristic of the EKA, uh, from my point of view, is that you offer the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. This is, I had to find it. Um, or PhD, uh, in a number of areas, including, uh, including art history and visual culture. So, I assume that I am the beneficiary, beneficiary of this fact, since I suspect that you would not be able to offer honorary doctorates if you did not also offer the kind that are earned with the hard and often thankless work of actually writing a dissertation. All I did for this was prepare a lecture. So. Um, now, this is no small detail, since in terms of the classical organization of knowledge, it suggests that the EKA, in its current form, shares certain attributes uh, <clears throat> with modern research universities, uh, as well as with modern art academies like the Bauhaus. So there's a kind of mixing of models. In one of the modern universities' founding philosophical documents, so now we'll have a, a brief philosophical uh, prelude, um, a short text called The Conflict of the Faculties from 1798, uh, Immanuel Kant began by asserting that the principal function of the university was to create doctors. That is, to confer the degree of doctor of philosophy upon a cohort of scholars uh, some of whom would go on to form the university's philosophy faculty. In Kant's day, uh, universities were typically divided into two ranks, or levels. Three higher faculties, as he called them, and one lower one. So the higher faculties, so-called because the type of knowledge they produced was more immediately useful to the monarch, uh, were most likely, uh, were, were what today we would, we would call professional schools. So these are the higher faculties. In Kant's day, it was the faculty of law, medicine, and theology. The lower faculty was the philosophy faculty. Today, the equivalent in, in the U.S., and, and, and it varies around the world, but the U.S. is usually called the faculty of arts and sciences, and is made up of the natural sciences, the social sciences, the humanities, um, uh, including philosophy itself. So that's the lower faculty. Kant argued that these two levels, lower and higher, were in perpetual conflict because the types of knowledge they produced were ultimately antithetical. Where the higher faculties, law, medicine, and theology, uh, were dedicated to the production and dissemination of useful knowledge, um, that is, knowledge with which to govern, so theology was knowledge with which to, go to govern in, in those days, um, the lower faculty was dedicated to the production of knowledge as such, including knowledge that may cause problems for those who govern by telling uncomfortable truths. Today, we sometimes call these two types of knowledge pure and applied, or knowledge for its own sake versus useful knowledge. The conflict arises, Kant points out, uh, when the lower faculty exercises its formal responsibilities by challenging the assumptions of the governors, calling out what he calls, quote, their arbitrary propositions. Um, if not, as Kant says, to state the whole truth in public, at least to see to it that everyone, everything put forward in public as a principle is true. That's Kant. In other words, according to Kant, uh, the responsibility of the lower philosophy faculty is to tell the truth in public, uh, which often means speaking truth to power. That's sort of our modern expression. In that sense, the type of knowledge produced and disseminated by this faculty, which in our fields includes historians of art and of architecture, uh, is directly or indirectly a form of critique. So the historians are typically on the lower faculty. Right? So directly or indi indirectly, they produce a form of critique. You can probably think of many examples of philosophers and other humanists uh, criticizing official discourse with inconvenient truths formed, as Kant would say, through the public exercise of reason. But, um, lest we assume that professional philosophers remain truth's sole guardians, it's worth remembering that among the most important truths <coughs> told in recent years is that which has been told collectively and repeatedly in public by vast numbers of natural scientists regarding the, the facts of planetary warming or climate change. So that is the job of philosophers and their allies on any faculty, including scientists and historians, 
to tell the truth, even if it's inconvenient. Now, I don't want to suggest that the EKAs are historians or troublemakers. I'm sure they're not. I don't know if we can ask the <clears throat> But the question I want to pose today is about the lines that separate lower from higher, history from design, pure from applied, that makes all of this possible. <clears throat> In short, the question is, what can the study of architecture's history uh, teach us about these lines, which both link and separate knowledge and society, or philosophy and the professions, and the worlds to which each belongs. So we're going to now do a little bit of architectural history. Not with this building quite yet, but something more recognizable. Of course, there are many different lines, most of which are, are invisible. Uh, each must be historicized and its architecture scrutinized uh, for doors, windows, gates, and other openings. For ultimately, such lines separate the orderly domain of knowledge uh, that is, of mathematics, of language, and of images, from the disorder of the real. Complex topologies of inside and outside, connected by secret passages and hidden openings, keep everything in place, including libraries. To study all of these is an enormous task, uh, well beyond what we can do in the short time here that we have together. So, for the remainder of my talk, then, I'm going to try to break down this task with some examples, some architectural examples, before returning with some provisional conclusions that perhaps point to future considerations. So, to set the stage, um, I want to ask you to consider these two images. They do not show the interior of any academic classroom or studio. Uh, rather, they show a typical floor in the headquarters of the Union Carbide Corporation, designed by the architect Gordon Bunchev uh, in New York, uh, with the collaboration of Natalie Dubois, uh, both of whom uh, were of the firm of Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, and completed in 1960. So it's on Park Avenue in New York. We can assume that the white men seen, meet, seen meeting in the room on the left and unseen in the row of offices uh, on the right. You see the offices, and then you have the secretary's desks outside. Um, <coughs> that these men were mostly college or university graduates. We can assume that, given the kind of uh, corporation in which they work. Since Union Carbide was a chemical company, they may, may have even been a scientist or two among them in this crowd over there. The women shown on the right, however, in that image, um, uh, most likely did not benefit from higher education, having, at best, probably attended trade schools to train for the work that they're shown doing in the secretarial pool. Now, both of the building's main designers, on the other hand, studied at American schools of architecture, that's Bunchaft and Dubois, uh, they studied at American schools of architecture that were based uh, at the time on the Beaux-Arts model. That is, unlike their Euro European predecessors, these schools uh, integrated, uh, the American architecture schools, integrated in, were integrated into research universities, uh, and thus belong to Kant's higher faculties, closer to the sovereign. Bunchaft studied architecture at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology at MIT, and Dubois, a pioneer in, the male -dominated, in a male-dominated field, was educated at the Western College for Women in Ohio, and then at Columbia's Graduate School of Architecture, where I now teach. Thus, in these two images, we see a gendered di division of labor um, and of education, cross-hatched with social class, uh, within which something like um, modern architecture flourished uh, during the post-war period in the United States, drawing gridded lines inside and outside uh, of buildings like these. So here, then, is another complex of lines, the Thomas J. Watson Research Center, designed by the Finnish-American architect Eero Saarinen for International Business Machines, or IBM, uh, in Yorktown Heights, New York, a suburb of uh, New York City, which opened in 1961. I thought I really should at least speak about Siren and, uh, here in Thailand. Um, seen in plan, uh, the building is a typical American college campus turned inside out. It's like a campus on, in, on the inside of the building, um, <clears throat> which is more or less how Siren described it when he, when he talked about it. Um, rather than a series of pavilions clustered around a quadrangle, um, as, uh, as at Harvard, here you see a 19th century image of Harvard, 
or a sequence of cloistered court, uh, courtyards, as at Yale in the early 20th century. Um, this elongated, expandable, curved building was designed to cultivate deep thought and even a little creativity. By this time, the Saarinen office had substantial experience in, um, <clears throat> uh, in designing campus plans. Uh, indeed, Aero Saarinen had grown up on and studied in uh, a campus designed by his father, Eliel, uh, for one of EKA's for one of the EKA's peer institutions. I mean, this is, I would, I would say, Cranbrook is, is probably, you know, quite parallel uh, in terms of its development uh, to, to EKA. Um, the Cranbrook Academy of Arts, uh, seen here alongside, on the upper left, the Cranbrook School for Boys in Bloom, Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, the, uh, designed by the elder Saarinen. The elder, Elio Saarinen, brought an arts and crafts sensibility to the design of the Cranbrook campus and to the Cranbrook Academy curriculum. The point, quite liter literally, was to counteract the urban alienation uh, and indeed racial strife of nearby Detroit with an idealized Nordic Gemeinschaft or organic community. Throughout his short but prolific career, and often with the help of fellow Cranbrook alumni, Charles and Ray Eames and Florence Knoll, uh, the younger Saarinen found, Aero, found, found ways to translate the community of the arts that he found here at Cranbrook into a modernist idiom suited to constructing different forms of corporate community for American business. Now, the Watson Research Center then um, was one such community, an inside-out campus uh, designed mainly for doctors of philosophy or PhDs, most of whom are computer scientists, uh, perhaps like the individual who we see, so he's our main subject. The, the guy over there, uh, at the end of the hallway, staring out the window. Now, ra rather than enclose these, so imagine him, he's a PhD scientist, computer scientist. Right? <clears throat> rather than enclose these office workers in little cubicles doing repetitive tasks, the idea was to free their minds. IBM was in the knowledge business, just on the other side of the line from university campuses on which its employee researchers had completed their dissertation, in which it had very close ties, including to Columbia. By this point, IBM's project products included large mainframe computers, as well as the software that ran on them, uh, and the expertise to run the software and the machine, uh, all of which the company leased to private government and private and government clients. That was their model. They leased the machines and the expertise. To develop new machines, new software, and new expertise, IBM was in, in perpetual need of new knowledge. Hence, the official company command, pronounced sternly by IBM's founder and the building's namesake, Thomas J. Watson, Sr. Think. This is what you're supposed to do at IBM. Think. So, you probably know how Apple... Apple repurposed this command in the 1990s as think different. But the commodification of difference was already part of IBM's uh, toolkit by the late 1950s, and certainly the 1960s, uh, when the company released the IBM 360, a flexible system uh, available in a 360-degree range of modules and a rainbow of five different colors. So, you know, in, in the mid-80s, uh, Apple, I mean, I don't know if any of you guys are probably too young for this, but uh, remembers or knows this commercial that Apple released of, of uh, this, this person that was a woman shown in commercials um, destroying the Big Brother uh, image of IBM uh, with their rainbow of color-coded um, happiness. Um, IBM also did color-coded happiness, but in the 1960s. So, at, but at the Watson Research Center, uh, difference applied equally to the objects designed and marketed by IBM and to its imagined subjects, the human beings from whose thinking minds the ideas behind these machines arose. So who then was this researcher, uh, this guy down at the end of the hallway, um, for whom uh, Saarinen uh, designed uh, this building? Above all, he, and he was almost always a white male, was a person, a unique individual. Far from being just another modular abstraction, um, uh, an organization man like at Union Carbide, 
Uh, this figure, as imagined and enabled by the architecture, exhibited all of the eccentricities of the stereotypical college professor or research scientist. Saarinen and his colleagues accommodated this figure's alleged individuality in a floor plan uh, organized around a rainbow of color-coded clusters, one per hallway, uh, equipped with a, with a modular partition system. So each of these hallways had a different, a different color going down the spine. Uh, uh, with a modular partition system that could, in theory at least, be arranged and adjusted as needed, so a flexible rainbow. There, in his little cell along the hallway, each researcher faced inward, uh, doing his specialized work. When he needed time and space to think, he would, again, theoretically and symbolically, go for a walk. He could also physically go for a walk. Um, not in the campus quadrangle or in, on the lawn, but along the curved, um, outward-looking exterior corridor. With an expansive, gently panoramic view of the rolling landscapes, landscape beyond that had been made famous a century earlier by the Hudson River School of American Painters. That's the, the landscape of Hudson Valley. Now, although this corridor was glazed floor to ceiling, the entire building was, in a certain sense, windowless. Thirty years before the advent of the personal computer, the, instrument, the instrument screens and IBM selectric typewriters that populated the desktops inside the cubicles, so just behind these doors were cubicles, um, uh, were forerunners of screens, desktops, and windows, that is, uh, Microsoft Windows, to come. Quite literally, then, the actual scientists working there simply moved off campus from an, uh, to an inside-out world uh, in which they found themselves reflected as in a kind of in a distorting mirror, their lives reduced to a corporate command. Think. So it's really this topology um, of, of off-campus scientists, inside-out walks, windowless windows, um, that I, I, uh, I want to kind of call your, to your attention, because it belongs to a reorganization of knowledge, power, and subjectivity that arose in the, uh, arose in the United States and elsewhere during the post-war years that I have uh, called the organizational complex, uh, which I defined uh, as um, the aesthetic and technological extension of the Cold War military-industrial complex. Now, perhaps later we can discuss its Soviet equivalent. Uh, but within this complex uh, was, was to learn to recognize, the thinking to think was to learn, and I think this was shared across the, or across the Cold War, to think was to learn to recognize patterns. Uh, for the IBM scientists, engineers, and designers, this included patterns of holes in cardboard holes in cardboard punch cards that programmed the company's machines, as well as the patterns of ones and zeros in the binary code that underlay them. So a kind of generalized pattern seeing that many of you are probably expert in without even quite realizing. <coughs> Thinking there was therefore um, work, previously reserved for scholars and scientists but gradually moved off campus to corporate laboratories like, like those at IBM, uh, as well as to nonprofit think tanks and other civil society extensions of academia. Both pure and applied at once, in these early years of computerization, knowledge, technical knowledge, uh, mathematical and scientific knowledge, social, social and economic knowledge, as well as engineering and design, was to a significant degree a function of the borderlines that defined where you did your thinking and how you did your thinking, as college campuses became corporate campuses, and vice versa. Okay, but so what about disorder? What forms of disorder did the new campuses and the new order, uh, this new order, suppress? Here's another inside-out campus, quite related to the one that I just showed you. Uh, also designed by Eros Iron and Associates, it's a laboratory for the Bell Telephone Company in New Jersey. Uh, Bell Labs. The original Bell Labs complex, which this, to which this is an extension uh, elsewhere in, in the same state, um, the original comp uh, Bell Labs was among the most important sites of communications research and development during the mid-century. In the early 1960s, the company expanded into this facility, uh, populated by computer scientists and engineers, there's a model of them, um, <clears throat> working on satellite communications and other research, for both the US government, including the military, 
and the corporate sector. Here again, in, in, this, in this plan, uh, we have inward-looking modular offices, so a very similar plan, uh, for concentrated thought and a wide outward-looking perimeter corridor, this here, um, for uh, reflective contemplation. Surrounding a large central atrium and wrapped on the outside with a gridded mirrored glass curtain wall, the first of its kind. Outside, the mirror reflected the suburban landscapes, landscape of clouds above and cars below, a kind of ambient white noise, an ominous everyday sublime, just barely under control, that was quite unlike IBM's picturesque Hudson Valley. This is the New Jersey suburbs, basically. It's not really what it looks like in New Jersey. Anyway, visually and formally, the disorder being managed by the grids and mirrors here was the social and psychological equivalent of information overload. Not yet the entropy of big data, but the sprawl of big science in the suburbs, with the Cold War and colonial wars running uh, in the background. Saarinen's design associate on both projects was Kevin Roach, a graduate of the Illinois Institute of Technology, uh, a campus dedicated to the higher professional faculties like engineering and architecture, uh, designed uh, by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. Together with John Dinkeloo, who was mostly responsible with, for technical matters in the office, Roche completed uh, the Bell Labs building uh, after Saarinen's untimely death in 1961. Roche and Dinkeloo would go on to design many important co corporate monuments uh, all around the world. Among their most enigmatic was another inverted campus, um, again, for the Union Carbide Corporation, so a different Union Carbide building, a horizontal scuster. Uh, but now in suburban Connecticut, um, completed the same year that Roche won the Pritzker Prize, actually, in 1982. Designed as a massive piece of infrastructure, this was uh, a building essentially without a facade. Instead of a central atrium, clusters of office pods surrounded a massive parking garage. You can see the, the clusters. Um, where suburban office, office, uh, office workers could, just, could park just outside their cubicle uh, and enter um, uh, without ever having to go outdoors, a kind of drive-in campus. So you could literally drive right, right into, your, into the garage and from the garage enter into the office space from there. This inversion, this kind of inside-out of parking and, and offices, um, allowed the offices to occupy the full perimeter, uh, clustered in a snowflake-like pattern, uh, that here you can see, you can see the drive in, uh, and then clustered in a snowflake like pattern in which every office was a corner office, um, with each occupant able to enjoy a theoretically equal piece of the surrounding landscape uh, from which both cars and people had been architecturally removed. So, the, the trick or the conceit here was to minimize hierarchy. Spatially and technologically, the building addressed Union Carbide's. American uh, employees as individualized persons, uh, or human resources, as the lingo goes, with, with more or less equal access to infrastructure, including personalized environmental controls in each office. <clears throat> the equality was, of course, a ruse, a pretense. Not only did the pseudo-democracy apply only to office workers, with support staff and maintenance workers left to fend for themselves, like any other major corporation, Union Carbide was ruled hierarchically, from the CEO to the board of directors on down, uh, with a sturdy glass ceiling for women. Still, Roche's design allowed the company's middle managers to imagine themselves and their co-workers as free individuals, stereotypical Americans, each a little different, with a different car, a different office, and a different view. I will have. Like IBM or Bell Labs, which allowed for what their designers imagined were the eccentricities of scholars wandering the corridor, like professors out for a campus stroll, thinking innovative thoughts, um, Union Carbide, uh, which was a chemical company, as I said, also depended on scientific and technological innovation, but of a different kind. Unlike the others, its profits derived mostly from manufacturing, 
Uh, among the, the company's most important products are fertilizers and pesticides uh, manufactured and sold in support of quote unquote agricultural revolutions around the world, including India's Green Revolution, uh, begun in the early 1960s. So it's not surprising that, the, that Union Carbide had a major pesticide manufacturing plant in Bhopal, India. And on the night of December 2nd, 1984, two years after Roche's building opened, 45 tons of the lethal gas methyl isocyanate, or MIC, leaked from a poorly man maintained storage, ta storage tank at the Bhopal plant. This too was a Union Carbide facility. The official death toll was 3,800, uh, roughly equivalent to the number of workers at Union Carbide's headquarters in suburban Connecticut. Activists and survivors estimated the toll to be uh, between 10,000 and 20,000, with as much as 500,000 people injured, many severely and permanently. Most of the victims, including an unknown number of Union Carbide's Indian employees, so-called human resources, lived next to the plant and were overcome by the gas as they slept. Many were from the poorest classes in Indian society and lacked citizen citizenship papers and other documents, so neither their lives nor their deaths were ever formally counted. Back in the American dream, a year after Bhopal in 1985, the midday clouds reflected, that you see here, reflected in a giant mirror at Bell Labs, and the ent entropy that they threatened uh, were transformed into an, an imagined airborne toxic event, as it was called, hovering over the Pennsylvania suburbs, by, quite famously by the writer Don DeLillo in his breakout novel, White Noise. In other words, by the mid-1980s, thinking <coughs> different uh, meant starkly differentiating the risks of knowledge work, like boredom, stress, and depersonalization, from those of physical labor. Uh, which was often performed for the same corporate body, like Union Carbide, uh, or indeed uh, its successor uh, corporation, Dow Chemical, in a different part of the world, by different people, living dramatically different lives. My larger point here is that in some distant but crucial way, the lines separating these lives are related to those separating the higher faculties from the lower ones in Kant's idealized elite university. This is an image from a protest at Berkeley. For by this time, corporations and universities were so enmeshed that critics began speaking of something like a corporate university to describe the inside-out connection of research and development on campus uh, with its profit-seeking and sometimes lethal deployment out in the world. The corporate campus plans that, that we've looked at track these developments internally in uh, what amounts to the design of the office worker as a thinking individual. individual. So, here then, to conclude my um, series of examples, is uh, an elite research university in the United States, uh, at which a good portion uh, of the most advanced research and development has been done uh, since the 1980s. Stanford University in Palo Alto, California, in the heart of what is now Silicon Valley. So we're going to try to return to where we are, um, where we began, uh, and, and think uh, about something like uh, a culture of design, ultimately, as it doubles back and feeds back into uh, the research university. Stanford is a classical research university based more or less on the Kantian model, the separation of higher and lower faculty. Although, like most, its faculties cannot be neatly divided into, uh, into lower and higher, pure and applied philosophy and the professions, such divisions still govern uh, to a significant degree. And the Stanford's humanities departments, for example, are just as distinguished as, as uh, the uh, science, natural sciences and, uh, and, and so on. Now to see them, uh, it's best to start to see these, these differences and the kind of blurring of these things. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's best to start in between, kind of on the border lines. One such line was drawn um, 
in, by the, early in the century, uh, by the Hoover Institution uh, of War, Revolution, and Peace, uh, founded on Stanford's campus in 1919, uh, a year after Estonian independence, uh, I might add, and five years after the EKA's founding. So, kind of quite contemporaneous. Um, the, the Hoover Institution, and quite related to this, to, it's basically founded out of the First World War. Hoover, um, the former U.S. President Hoover, uh, founded this uh, in order to, to, to protect and, and, and preserve the documents uh, that were sort of scattered by the war, uh, and documents of various uh, uh, survivors and, 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 and victims and so on, so from the first world. The Hoover Institution was a semi-autonomous research institute that shortly after moving into its new building here, uh, uh, the Hoover Tower, this is from 1940-41, became one of the premier think tanks of the post-Cold War uh, economic and political order. So it, it, during the Second World War, the, the Hoover Institution got this new building, and after the war became uh, a very, very important um, think tank, tank of basically the Cold War political economic order. Architecturally, this campus building uh, is, is very different from the other ones uh, that I've been showing you. First of all, it's actually located on a university campus. Um, but, it's, but also, its modernism is much more muted. Uh, its simplified, vaguely Art Deco forms combine distant references to the neoclassicism of the École des Beaux-Arts uh, that shaped many American campuses with the mission style um, uh, of Northern California that connected the Stanford campus to uh, the legacy of the Spanish Empire. This connection uh, is even more evident um, uh, in Stanford's original central quadrangle, which you see here, this is the main sort of core of the, of the Stanford campus, um, completed in 1906 by Shetley, Rutan, and Coolidge, which is the successor firm uh, to Henry Hobson Richardson, H. A. Richardson, uh, in a neo-Romanesque manner with sharp mission-style accents such as the red tile roofs. The Hoover Tower, in which the Hoover Institution is housed, here you see it's the campus, is the, the quadrangle is just down here, and then the tower is off to the side, um, uh, and is, uh, sits just off to the side of this quadrangle, distinctively marking the skyline. Designed by Arthur Brown, Jr., and completed in 1941, the tower mainly houses the Hoover Library and Archives, with its windowless, fluted shaft, Again, so you notice that there are no windows up all the way up. Um, it's windowless fluted shaft shielding the books and the scholars inside from daylight outside. Now this is a different kind of interiority. You notice that we're doing we're thinking about insides and outsides again. A different kind of interiority from that exhibited by the other corporate campuses that we've just seen. It's the inter interiority of the library and archive rather than that of the laborator laboratory and office. Like Roche, Saarinen, and the off-campus campuses that they designed, the Hoover Institution and its architect, Arthur Brown, were representatives of what was known in the US by 1970 as the military-industrial-academic complex, uh, and of the organizational complex that uh, lay at its heart, balancing order with disorder. Dedicated to preserving the records of what its founder, former pre US President Herbert Hoover, regarded as a human striving for freedom against totalitarianism, by the 1960s, the Hoover Institution had become an anti-communist bastion of US Cold War policy. So this is sort of where we need. At some point during the 1960s, students and faculty at, at Stanford uh, staged a protest, so during the Vietnam War, staged a protest uh, on the steps of the Hoover Institution against the US-led war in Vietnam, and against the role of research institutions like Stanford in supplying both technology and ideology uh, for that war. The image of the, the protest against Dow Chemical was also from the Vietnam uh, era. They were providing the chemicals for uh, napalm. Uh, against the role played in US foreign policy, uh, and especially the protest at, at Stanford was against the role played, by, in, played in US foreign policy by the academics who worked as researchers and as fellows in the Hoover Institution's library. 
uh, and it's, as well as its archives and its offices. At one point during the protest, so on the left, there's the at one point during the process, the institution's president, W. Bruce, w. Bruce Campbell, uh, noticed that the students had, le had left a microphone on the steps. Grabbing the mic, uh, Campbell began lecturing his audience on conservative principles in an inadvertent parody of an earlier, rather famous speech by Mario Sav Savio, a philosophy student uh, uh, who was a leader on the right um, of the free speech movement at Berkeley. So uncannily, Savio's speech took place on the steps of Sproul, Sproul Hall, which is another campus building designed it's on the Berkeley campus by the same architect of the Hoover Tower, Arthur Brown. So two protests uh, on the same uh, on, uh, building of the same camp by the same architect. But the Hoover Institution um, was more than just a stage for a politics of knowledge. Established as a repository of documents related to war, revolution, and peace. By the early 1980s, the Hoover Institution had become the, the principal archive of the history and ideology of neoliberal economic theory, including what you, you here may recognize as the doctrine of strategies uh, of rapid privatization and austerity, popularly known as shock therapy, which are, of course, widely employed uh, during the post-Soviet era. Campbell, the institution's president, who had lectured on the steps, uh, was an economist and early member of the Mount Pelerin Society, the organization of professional economists that became a clearinghouse for neoliberal thought during the post-war period. Other more famous members including, included the economists Milton Friedman and Friedrich von Hayek, uh, both of whose papers are now stored in the Hoover Institution archive. So this became a kind of archive of neoliberal economic thought. The Stanford Economics Department, on the other hand, was not directly connected to the Hoover Institution, so they're, they're separate. Um, during the 1950s, the university's faculty even included one of the very few Marxist economists in the country, in the US, uh, Paul Baran. This is one reason that the Hoover Institution's half-in, half-out status as a kind of academic think tank uh, is interesting. Unlike the economics department, which, again, in Kant's terms, uh, remained among the lower faculties and thus retained a degree of academic freedom. They even had a Marxist on the faculty. The, Ho the Hoover Institution served a higher god. As its stylized library tower suggests, the institution and its building belong to a symbolic and political order that grew out of the research campus, research campus in general, but faced mainly outward precisely be, be towards sort of foreign policy, towards Washington, basically. Um, precisely because its fellows faced inward, concentrating on their books. So in other words, it was, it was the academic position and, in a sense, status of this institution that gave it the, the legitimacy uh, to more or less conduct or, or assist them in the conduct of foreign policy uh, from within the university. So, Okay. In the late 1930s, uh, Stanford's administration had embarked on a project of investing in those areas of research in which the faculty was particularly distinguished, such as physics and electrical engineering. The result was what university administrators called steeples of excellence, which meant certain departments that rose above the rest. This, in turn, supported the larger goal of building the university with the help of government grants as well as uh, to strengthen the ties with industry, so to grow the university, this is Stanford. An early outcome uh, of, this, uh, of this policy was the Stanford Research Institute, um, or SRI, home of the world's first computer mouse, among many other things, um, that was located off campus in the town of Palo Alto. And Palo Alto is a kind of, kind of suburban town uh, in which it's kind of the center of Silicon Valley um, uh, in which Stanford is located. The SRI, the Stanford Research Institute, uh, grew largely out of work done in the, in the university's Department of Electrical Engineering. Now, so whether engineering, uh, you know, what is engineering? I mean, should it be counted, counted among the higher professional faculties as, as a form of applied knowledge, um, you know, kind of useful knowledge? 
uh, or among the lower faculties for establishing the fundamentals of computer science, as many of the, the people teaching and working in the in Stanford's engineering department did. Um, where should it be, higher or lower? This is, in some sense, less important, since on the Stanford campus, in the town of Palo Alto, and in Silicon Valley more generally, such categories were blended indistinguishably, if not entirely erased. So in the longer term, uh, Stanford's presence was an important reason that Silicon Valley developed as it did. But as Apple and others uh, working in the tradition of IBM have shown, design and the applied arts uh, were just as crucial for the, uh, the rise of tech. Uh, after all, I mean, who designed this thing? Somebody has to design it, right? <clears throat> design and the applied arts um, were just as crucial for the rise of tech as were fields like engineering and computer scientists. So this is where sort of design really comes in. To this, we must add, however, that the economic ideology archived and reproduced at neoliberal th think tanks like the Hoover Institution. Yes, this is related to design. Which, as the libertarianism of many tech CEOs today shows, I don't know, I mean, if you follow the Facebook drama, but uh, this is one among many, as the libertarian of, of, the, of, of tech CEOs uh, shows today, um, uh, this kind of neoliberal uh, political economy uh, has become Silicon Valley's governing religion. So they are, in some sense, the theology department. Um, this has less to do with the support of tech companies for specific political candidates or policies than it does with a socio-technical system of commerce and culture that they have engineered, That, in the sense that the place and the kind of sort of imaginary Silicon Valley stands for, um, <clears throat> that they have engineered, designed, and now maintained as individualistic, creative, and allegedly free-thinking managers of our collective infrastructural future. Okay, finally. Fairly recently, in 2005, uh, Stanford University started what they call a design school, known as the D School, a place for explorers and experimenters, which is located actually just behind the original quad. It's right behind the, the quad that I showed you. Um, this is where the otherwise separate, separate spheres of Art Academy and Research University join, with faculty members from engineering, business, classics, English literature, and political science, uh, political science history, and so on, um, assemble all, they have all these kind of affiliated faculty, they all come together uh, into a collective, collaborative project of design thinking. Now, I refer to this project not as something unusual, uh, but, as you probably know, an increasingly typical variation on the conflict of the faculties. Design, we know, is now a code word that refers to everything from product development to manage management strategies to marketing. No doubt, no doubt, Kant would have been horrified. But he would also have recognized that design elevates the arts, and with them perhaps even philosophy, from lower to higher, brings them closer to Silicon Valley where the power is. Um, used in this way, design subordinates the critical and reflective functions of the fine arts in conversation with philosophy, exploiting instead their capacity to capture and maintain attention and manage the imagination. But it also calls the arts to their historical responsibility. This is we all, where we all come in together. Design calls the arts to, its, to their historical responsibility as allies of philosophy. Because what I've been calling an organizational complex with its corporate campuses populated by pseudo-individualized deep thinkers has today become something like a design complex populated by allegedly free-thinking imagineers who surf the business cycles and trade imbalances abstracted and theorized by economists and other social scientists like those working in the Hoover Tower. Now, another way of saying this is that the modern university, with the assistance of the modern arts, including architecture and design, has moved slowly and unevenly from the order of books to the order of business. One monument to this transition is located on the campus of Columbia University, where, as I said, I work. This is Loeb Memorial Library, 
designed by the New York firm of McKim, Mead, and White, and opened in 1897 uh, when Columbia moved its campus to its current location. I'll show you that here. My office uh, is in the building just to the right. Uh, the former Macy Villa of the former Bloomingdale Asylum. That's where they keep the architecture faculty. Uh, which is now called Buell Hall, where the Buell Center, which I direct, is. Some years ago, uh, I had the honor of meeting the former Estonian president, uh, Tomas Hendrik Ilves, in Low Library, in the dome, in the center there, when he visited Columbia and spoke under the building's dome. We talked briefly afterwards about his enthusiasm for wooden architecture. Apparently he liked wooden architecture. That's what he said. Low Library, where he spoke, uh, modeled on Thomas Jefferson's famous library at the University of Virginia, which was itself modern, modeled on the Roman Pantheon, um, was once a temple to books. There were actual books in this building at one point. Uh, long ago, however, the books moved across campus to another library, Butler Library, um, and the building is now a temple to administration, housing the president's office, the university lawyers, and, and other managers. So. <laughs> uh, presidents, prime ministers, and other dignitaries now speak in what was once the library reading room. So this is where Hildes spoke. It didn't look, doesn't look like that anymore. So, Low Library, which incidentally was built with money from the China trade, so it's not somehow pure, uh, uh, is quite representative of the changing role of universities and their faculties with respect to society, amid the changing topologies of knowledge that we have been following uh, here with Architecture's Hell. Uh, when he spoke in this room, Thomas Hendrik Ilves was in good company. I think. Um, because a few decades earlier, somewhat, this was, I don't remember what year, it was 2000 or something, a few, a few decades before that, in 1980, the French philosopher Jacques Derrida also spoke in Low Library in this room, under the Rotunda Dome, on the centenary of the founding of Columbia's Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, uh, which is the academic body uh, that oversees the university's uh, doctoral programs, like the one in which I speak. So I thought I would close, since we are here uh, celebrating a centenary plus five, I thought I'd close with Derrida speaking on the centenary of the school in which I teach. Um, there Derrida spoke of the imbalances uh, signaled by Kant's conflict of the faculties, and of the leverage that the lower faculties still had, the philosophy faculties still had, to influence the higher. He um, deconstructed the distinction between forms of knowledge, philosophical and professional, not because that distinction did not apply, but because, paradoxically, applying it meant violating it. Who, after all, decides where to draw such a line separating the philosophers from the professionals? Who gets to decide that? Who, in other words, guards the knowledge that makes knowledge about knowledge possible? Who are the guardians? If we, if we force the issue and go with the philosophers, maybe along with the historians and a few others, as guardians of truth over the professional guardians of political order, then we must also, in other words, the representatives of disorder, potentially, um, we must also accept the responsibility to tell the truth, um, as I have tried to do, uh, about how doctors of philosophy or PhDs became businessmen as insides moved out and outsides moved in. In 1784, Immanuel Kant began his famous remarks on enlightenment uh, with a categorical imperative, a command, sapere aude, dare to know, dare to know. I therefore conclude with these philosophers by asking simply, what else can we do, we doctors of philosophy, denizens of universities and of art academies, uh, but continue to, to obey this command as a friendly collegial rebuke to the higher faculties, if not exactly a refusal uh, of the sinister corporate command. Think.
Time for questions. What? I can ask one sure. rather simple one. Yeah. Just to clarify a bit. Uh, so if one would think of a kind of separation of a applied and free thinking as a kind of topologically speaking as a uh, like a cylinder yeah. which has a clear inside and outside side your lecture actually kind of uh, suggests that it's more akin to a Mary strip. Yeah, like some Klein bottle. Yeah, or yeah, Klein bottle, one of these, yes. So this it's kind of endless cycle of these yeah. changes. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, we could, we could ask, I mean, if the historian's version of, you know, kind of response would be, okay, has, has this always been the case in some ways? And I, I, I don't think that, that what, what I'm talking about, like, for example, in Silicon Valley in the 1900s or 1990s or 2000s is the same as, as what Kant was, you know, talking about 200 years before that. Things have changed. However, he did recognize uh, also, and he, he actually plays with this in, even in this in this text, um, the kind of interplay between higher and lower. I mean, he sort of makes these slightly ironic comments. Kant was pretty funny, actually, if you read. Uh, ironic comments about what the philosophers can do. You know, it's like, well, they have to they have to obey. You know, argue but obey is the other command that that, that he, he associates with enlightenment. We can argue. As long as you obey, you know, in the end, do your job, don't make too much trouble, right? But within that, you know, clearly, you, you know, in a practical historical sense, there are all kinds of ambiguities. So where's the line between argument and, and obedience? Uh, so, so, you know, I think we can say historically that that line, to the extent, you know, within this the organization, the sort of structures of modern knowledge and, and their institutions like universities, and probably also guilds and other, you know, the medieval precursors in, in one way or another, and, and, and the church, um, uh, and the monasteries. This, this, has, this has existed in some form. Uh, and, uh, but it, what it has constantly changed. And, and what I've tried to do is to track some of the changes uh, in, in the past century or so. Um, and we could talk about earlier, too, would, would be interesting. But, Anyway, I don't know if that makes sense. So, so the Klein bottle would be a, a kind of model to think with, but it would be, you know, have to be a different one in some sense, each in each circumstance or each particular case. Uh, and so the, the you know classic historian's question of continuity versus change, what remains the same across epochs versus what changes in different contexts under different conditions. Um, and and I would just add because. Pretty clearly, when, when you know implicitly here, um, the big change that we might attribute a kind of causal agency to is computerization, because computers they're developed in universities and, and in you know in collaboration with the government and military. It's happening on both sides, uh, in the Soviet environment as well as and in Germany as well as in, in North America, and um, or in England and. Uh, they kind of develop on the line, or I don't know, you know, where would we put that in the Klein bottle computer, right? Uh, and and they kind of work in both directions or several. But but it, but again, if you look carefully at the, at the history of computing, then you understand we can't really just say that there was like a technological development that didn't change, you know, had some causal effect. So even on the on this other level of how do things change, we have ambiguities. You know that, that are a little bit like which comes first. Um, so com in this way, I would summarize this: is that computerization is a necessary but not sufficient uh, uh, event uh, for the changes that I've been trying to explain to have occurred. It's part of the changes, and it, to some extent, it, it sort of you know very much helped to accelerate and to shape those changes. But we cannot identify some technological development as a kind of primary sort of final cause. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, welcome back. Hi. But um, I guess, and this is a kind of a bit dumb question, but I just like uh, topological thinking. Uh -huh. Like it, it, it works really well when you're looking at the screen and you're thinking, okay, so I understand mm -hmm. the relations between these things and yeah. the inverted logics. But as it comes to understanding what to do, what to do with it? What to do with it? Because <laughs> That's an then we start using think again, right? So 
then yeah. this kind of like this language is to think to know oh, to dare to know. Right. Like how much of the, like you kind of go we're going to be doing some of the thinking because yeah. we live in a computerized yeah. world. So then somehow yeah, I I this is somehow you there's like this defense of some sort of structural thing that in itself then protects something. Right. Yeah. And well, this is a threat, I don't know like, yeah. you could the answer. Yeah. No, that's a great question. I, okay, I'll try to answer with an allegory, uh, but it's a historical allegory. One of the most important contributions of this period, not of this guy, but uh, from the, this period, is this conceptually. Uh, you could even say philosophically, is the Turing test, uh, you know, which answers, tried to answer the question, can machines think? And, and to, to make a longer, long story short, the, the, the format of the test is, is basically that a human and a computer respond to questions posed by another human, and, and uh, to the point that, that you know, the, the answers given by the, uh, by the computer start, you know, another human can't, can't, can, can't distinguish between the answers given by the computer or, the, uh, or, the, uh, or, the, or another human being. Um, if, when that happens, then theoretically at least the machine would have at least simulate it successfully and therefore you know, maybe even actually thought. Um, so, okay, the pro but what I want to do is to sort of reverse that question and turn it on its head and, and ask about the human. Mm -hmm. Like, who is this human that can't distinguish the words coming out of a machine from words coming out of a, a, a human? So, so what's, what's at stake in this is, is at both a kind of ontological, philosophical level and at a, in a practical, political sense, our humanity. Um, not, you know, not necessarily in some absolute metaphysical way. We could discuss that. You know, many have uh, with respect to artificial, artificial intelligence and so on. What that, like, you know, when Deep Blue, when, when IBM's computers finally beat humans at chess, it's a crisis for humanity. Right? But the question is, why is this a crisis? You know, and and so that's why I'm, I'm trying to call attention to to the way human subjectivity is changing here, is being shaped and reshaped. So one way to think about this, is, and design is, is a very important actor or agent in, in this process, in this change. One way to think about it is that like everybody today is a designer. So, so you, know, one, you know, an answer to the question, what to do, is to design, design something. But, but you know that immediately when you do that, and probably everybody in this room knows somehow that when you do that, you're being called into an existing order, which I'm basically referring to in this, as the neoliberal order of the design complex. Um, Maybe it's very direct, like some kind of marketing exercise, or maybe it's indirect, like some sort of like interesting experience that has no value, but nonetheless could be monetized later on. So, so that's the practical, like how to, you know, for designers, how to navigate that, and for scholars, how to describe it. You know, how to make, how to map that thing. And so I, I'm not, I don't really, you know, I'm not going to, I don't have like a, a, a prescription other than to f repeat Kant's words and say, as you did too, to, to dare to know, to, to take it on, to think, but to think, you know, against this guy. You know, to, to think what it means not to think in the way that he is commanding you to do that. That's a difficult one because it, it requires both this kind of philosophical agility and the practical agility, higher and lower, you know, in a sense, lower and higher faculty, um, to, 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 to work your way in it, within and between this basically trap. Um, so, you know, I, this comes up with students all the time <laughs> in, in design schools. You know, they say, okay, what do I do? <laughs> I have to design something. Um, and, you know, you can also refuse. That's one possibility. That's what the students who are protesting there were doing. Uh, I'm not trying to incite, sorry. <laughs> Some kind of refusal. But, uh, but there are moments in which we all say no at some point. Um, but if you're obliged to say yes for whatever reason, uh, I'm just really just inviting you to, 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 to think critically and reflexively, uh, to have the kind of awareness of, that a critical philosopher might have. Um, and, I mean, Kant had this problem too. He, he was being censored. The, basically, the, the, the um, conflict of the faculties piece that I was referring to is a late piece that the response to his early censorship, his censorship that he didn't expect was Friedrich, uh, the great successor, Wilhelm II, who, you know, was like, didn't come, he, 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 he didn't, he was not as enlightened uh, a monarch uh, from Kant's point of view, 
uh, as his predecessor, and he was starting to control particularly religious speech or the Kants and others' uh, sort of challenges to the, to the orthodoxy uh, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the, Christ, the Christian monarch. And so, um, so he wrote this polite and not so polite. He, it was for him both a, a, an observation and also an action to reply to the monarch. And you can read the preface where he, you know, very politely and genuflects before the monarch, and at the same time says, "No, I'm not going to do as I'm told uh, because I have something to say, and 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 that that what I have to say is reasonable and." Uh, and rational, and, 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 and I want to exercise my ob obligation, you know, as an enlightened uh, figure, individual, to, uh, to speak in public. So, you know, so you can also articulate your thoughts in, in various ways. I, I know these are all uns unsatisfactory answers uh, to the question, but, but I, you know, we also talk in pragmatic ways institutionally, what we all do, I don't know, what you do here, and what, what I do, or try to do what we try to do. To address these kinds of contradictions, yeah. I don't know. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Try to help. <laughs> yeah. I have. Thank, first of all, thank you. But uh, I have a more like a historical yeah. story. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, more traditionally, we could think of this kind of trajectory as the withdrawal of the state and mm -hmm. then kind of the weakening of the state yeah. and towards the neoliberal state. Um, and. Um, and in that framework, it, it's really interesting. I think the tower, you know, the, the, yeah. the sort of uh, Hoover right. in, Institute tower, which sort of has some of these um, boom, uh, let's say, late uh, this depression. Oh, definitely. Uh, yes, it does. Era, uh, uh, it, architecture yeah. reference yeah. these kind of transforming into this institute, which becomes the other for the neoliberal. Right. So, um, so in a way, it's not really about it at all, but 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 the. How, how does really public architecture fit into that framework that you, that you have? Because there's a lot of, we could think of a lot of similar kind of glass and steel architecture, which, which is also about the public right. in, the, in the 50s, the Kennedy Center comes to mind. Uh, yeah, sure. So yeah, Lincoln Center. Uh, yeah, I mean, for sure. Uh, so, okay, first of all, on the, on the, the tower, um, There, ahead, right there. So, yeah, this is, you know, this could be a Nazi monument. <laughs> it could be a Soviet monument. It, it, it could be, in the U.S. context, probably most directly would be recognizable uh, as speaking the language of the New Deal, of, of the Roosevelt era uh, in which it was built, um, and of the public art and civic architecture. There are a number of uh, examples from that period that this is more or less citing. And so, the... Uh, but the, in terms of the, um, the, the and of course, this is built in, it's 41 during the war, uh, and the US you know, is headed towards Europe uh, at the time. And um, the, uh, you, you know, the, 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 this idea that the neoliberal, the neoliberal orthodoxy equals the weakening of the state is only in some ways partially true. Yes, it does typically mean deregulating markets. But the U.S. state was probably the strongest that it had been through the 20th century at this point uh, during full wartime mobilization, like shortly after the uh, opening of this building. And, and so, you know, it was on a war economy. And then after the war, um, you had these concepts like total war that were developed to engage the universities, and particularly the research scientists, the physicists in, in particular, the nuclear physicists, in the, in the, in the kind of perpetuation of the Cold War. So in that sense, on the military side, um, the, the state grows. It doesn't, you know, the military in the US setting in particular is the guardian of deregulation. Uh, that's the first thing. So the state, it's a kind of paradox. What seems like a sort of withdrawal of the state is actually an enhancement of the state at, at other levels. And that may, you know, it may not be entirely uh, coincidental that, that a certain kind of architectural language is, it, it can be associated with that, with a kind of monumental, uh, uh, quote, proto-authoritarian sort of state, idea of the state, the military state. Now, on the other side, the, the one you're talking about, this kind of more transparent, modernist, you know, allegedly rational, enlightened 
uh, kind of architecture of the post-war period uh, in the U.S. Sure, you know, um, the uh, you know I I, I don't want to overly generalize, but but um, again, one of the most interesting buildings from this period is the Pentagon, uh, which is a precursor. It's the world's largest office building until the World Trade Center is built. And uh, and it's it's a it's a it belongs in this story even though I haven't I didn't write it into the story here, um, but uh, but you also you know you have other civic buildings, uh, cultural you know buildings, libraries and so on, uh, of various types like the ones you met Kennedy Center or an architect. There are lots of certain architects are, are often to be found doing this work like I am Pei. Uh, even, I mean, Johnson is the architect of uh, basically, and Harrison Abramowitz actually, uh, uh, Lincoln Center. Um, and, you know, this, a lot of this comes in practical terms out of their ties to the government that came out of the war. Some of them worked, like Sarnin worked for the government. He's one of them, too, uh, during the war. Like, he does the embassy, in the U.S. Embassy in, in London. And uh, so, you know, formally there are differences. Most of Sarinan's buildings that are done, you know, in that, in the kind of civic stuff, buildings are, a little, are more, in, it's like the expressions of Sarinan that we know from TWA and, and so on. Um, so we might ask, what does the state need under these circumstances? I, again, I'm not, I don't want to generalize, but the state seems to need some sort of architectural expression uh, during the post-war period. And it, it tends towards a triumphalist expression, but it's not necessarily monumental in this way. It's, it's modernist and, and exuberant sometimes, even as in, as in Siren's case. I don't know if that helps uh, answer. So, you know, these are, these are differences. They're internal differences, but they are, they can be related, and especially when you think, when, when you recognize that the, the state and sort of private sector model is itself topologically entwined and, and also quite, you know, empirically interconnected um, then and as it is uh, still today. Connection to Palo Alto. Oh. So, why power should listen to academia, to architects? Uh, why, why power? Why, why, should why should they care? You know, it's funny. I sometimes wonder about that myself. One thing, one thing I can tell you is that still, one of the few things that we have, we academics, we still have a kind of some kind of prestige. Uh, this is one. There, there's a kind of symbolic answer, uh, this, and then there's an instrumental answer. Um, the symbolic answer is they still send their kids to colleges like Stanford, Columbia, Harvard, and whatever. That, that's where they. That's the power elite. That's where you know they, they, the kids have to go. So there's something about this. This is you know maybe it's purely symbolic. It has to do with the, the history and legacy of these institutions as seats of governing since the 18th century, really, in the, in the U.S. context. This is where there are differences. But in, it is closer to England, maybe, than it is to Germany, where Oxford and Cambridge play a role like this. And it's because college, like, you know, basically the, the Hochschule and, and up, is still, you know, undergraduate education in the liberal arts, in humanities, in the natural sciences, pre-professionally. It, it is, is still understood as, as, as belonging, uh, as a sort of purview of, of academics rather than uh, some sort of state function, like build up this. So that's one. The other one, instrumentally, is, is that you can't win a war without the research scientists. And, and so, the, and nor can you deal with climate change without, without science. Um, the question then is the philosophy, and all the rest of us who may consider ourselves allies of Kant's philosophy family. They, they try to keep us quiet. There's a, there's a you know quite actively uh, effort to um, you know to sort of uh, minimize the influence uh, of of the humanities by defunding by by marginalizing by commercializing uh, and so on. But Stanford would not be Stanford without without its philosophy department. And Palo Alto, you know, this is I think it's just I have to just answer this in this very empirical way. Take away the humanities from any of these institutions, and 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 they are not what they claim to be, symbolically and as in sites of power. MIT built up its humanities after the war 
in, in the, while they were working on you know military stuff. So because there's also this other complex problem that that the power imagines in order to be powerful, one must imagine to to possess a soul. So this, this is a, another dialectic we won't have time to go into, but the function of the humanities has been to restore the soul to power. Um, and, and one thing we can do, therefore, in answer to the question, is say, no. No soul. We don't do that. We're not priests. We're not, you know, members of the theology department. We're philosophers. We don't, we, we don't need the soul. We think otherwise. And so, uh, and if you want, to, you want to restore your soul after killing all these people in Bhopal, or, uh, or, or you know, um, murdering uh, any, you know, hundreds of thousands, uh, in, in various military campaigns, uh, then don't come to me, go somewhere else. And, and that's something we can, we can do. Yeah. I don't know the way time I, uh, we have more questions. Last quick question. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll be quick. I know it's going on forever. <laughs> <laughs> Were you at present when Terry gave a lecture? Sorry? Were you present when Terry Dow gave a lecture? Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, uh, I was in college. No, I wasn't even, I was in high school. <laughs> did, did he give a certain type of model of thinking where how to approach his questions? Like he raised questions, but he obviously doesn't give an answer. Does he give any kind of a system of thinking? Or yes. Or yeah, I would recommend, the essay is called Moklos. It, it, it means Greek for lever, leveraging, leverage. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's published in English, it's translated. Um, and this is a French version. You know, you can you can find this, this essay in Derrida. Uh, just look Derrida conflict of the faculties, you'll find it. But um, and he he goes through a whole uh, reading of you know as as is characteristic of, of Derrida a, a careful close reading of Kant's text. Um, it's in relation to Heidegger's speech actually on assuming the rectorship uh, in Heidelberg. So it's this is, a, this is a big and it was at the time right in the early '80s. It was like that year I think that. That um, Paul Demand's uh, early kind of you know uh, Nazi type writings were were discovered. So there was a big controversy actually surrounding philosophy, modern philosophy, and politics right at the time. And he addresses this uh, in his talk as well. Um, and and you know I th I, I think we could summarize. I mean Derrida for him it was always a call to responsibility, and I am in some ways echoing this, but but with a, a different inflection. Uh, not the responsibility solely and merely in the sense to read text, to read critically, to, 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 to work in the library uh, with, these, with these texts, uh, but, but, but also to do other kinds of work and, and uh, other forms, and to engage other forms of thinking, which could even include design thinking. Um, the talk actually was given at a symposium uh, on, uh, on graduate type education, and, and the, you should, the list of other speakers at the symposium was amazing. It was like robotics specialists and other. He was like one or two. Kristeva was the only woman. Julia Kristeva was the other philosopher. Uh, all guys uh, and all full of uh, you know science, technology, and some literature. Uh, so I'm sure that you know shortly at, in, at lunch and dinner at the symposium they had the same conversation. You know uh, that that we're having. And you know yeah, there's not as you say. Not a, a prescription, a script, a particular kind of answer, but there is a sense of responsibility. Right? There's a sense, as a kind of call, and that's what the, that we, what we, we hear, I think, over and over again when we're presented, you know, with these kinds of these kinds of contradictions. Uh, is a call to think through them, to work through them, um, in an unstable and kind of precarious way, like not being quite sure about whether we're in or out. Um, but uh, and Derrida does talk about the, these complex topologies uh, in, in that in that text. And so uh, he's he's well aware of, of of the map that I'm trying to draw for you here. And the one thing to conclude I, that I've just tried to do for you today is to provide something like a cognitive map, a kind of way of you know situating ourselves in in this domain in this space uh, that might strategically be be valuable, maybe even useful. In, in practically trying to try to think through some of these questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.